everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Castle. I'm the director of Southboro Youth and Family Services, and tonight's presentation is uh, part of our Mental Health Awareness Month programming. We have Carrie Tool here from Castlebrook Counseling. I'm going to be doing a presentation about teen brains and emotions. Uh, at Castlebrook Counseling, we do a lot of work with adolescents, and we do a lot of work in a type of treatment called dialectical behavior therapy. Um, so I'm going to be sprinkling in a little bit about DBT um, and a lot about adolescent brains um, to talk about with parents and families and teens themselves uh, to help kind of um, give a little background information about what's going on with kids and emotional development. Mm -hmm. Excellent resource for, for parents and adults alike who are uh, working with youth. tonight I really appreciate it so um, to get started when we're teaching DBT in our um, offices we do something beginning at the beginning of every DBT skills group which is mindfulness so there's a lot of um, research coming out about mindfulness practices that help us get centered and focused and not so scattered and be able to be present in the thing that we're about to do so we're going to do a mindfulness exercise here together. So I was just telling Ryan that sometimes I have one where there's a lot of stomping, but given that this is a library, probably not the best choice. So 
um, we're going to do something called Zen counting. Okay, as a group, whenever the mood strikes you, one person is just going to say one, and then somebody else is going to say two, and somebody else is going to say three, and we're going to keep going to see how far up we can go. Um, if two people say the same number at the same time, we go back to one. Okay, so just notice what you notice. All right, be aware and see how you feel what you pick up on through the exercise and then after the exercise. Okay, questions, comments, concerns, bad jokes? No, nope? good? Okay, excellent, I have a lot of bad jokes, sorry. So, all right, so whenever the mood strikes you. One. Good. All right. That's a good stretch. We might just keep going. So what did people notice about that? What did you pick up in your experiences as we were doing that? Who wants to share? Yeah, you just need a strategy. You need a strategy. So what did you have as a strategy? Just try to go as fast after a number. Right. Like yep. Yep. So you thought you were trying to slide it in, right? Yep. Yep. So and kind of coming up with the logic about doing that strategy. Does anybody else have something? that they thought of? They, listening? Yeah, what were you listening for? What did you notice as you were listening? Just kind of, I waited until there was a pause, and I figured everybody else was afraid to pick it, pick so then I finally. Yeah, so you were trying to time it and then listen to people around you, right? Yeah, so sometimes in the group we'll do, We'll do it with our eyes closed so that your only input is like the sound of somebody taking a breath in or somebody fidgeting. And so you really have to tune into your environment and be really present and really mindful. So what we're doing when we're teaching mindfulness is to, again, get everybody to kind of tune into their own experiences and slow down and be present. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why that's so important. So, um, so like... Sarah said, I am the director at Castlebrook Counseling Services in Westboro. We have been around since 2013. Um, there's about 25 different therapists here. Not all of us do DBT services. Uh, not all of us see kids, but we have kind of, we run the gamut on, you know, ages and um, specialties. We see anxiety. We have a lot of DBT. Uh, my specialty is suicidal and self-harming teenagers. Uh, we have a lot of other clinicians there who have that specialty as well. Other folks who see couples, elders, you name it, we see it. Um, so we've been, we've been booming and um, some of my, the uh, parents of the DBT kids that I work with have really been encouraging me to kind of take the show on the road in terms of talking about DBT and kids and brains and their development because it's something I'm very passionate about. So you'll see me get really nerdy in a little bit, so stay tuned for that. So we're going to talk tonight about team brains and their emotions. How is it all kind of gelling together. There's a lot of different factors in, you know, around um, why adolescent brain development is really unique. It's a unique point in life. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, a lot about that. We're going to talk about what is going on with kids these days. It's a whole new world, right? Adolescence is not the same as what it was when we were kids. There's so many other factors. So we're going to kind of go line by line. Um, through that, talk a little bit about uh, teen brains. So what is going on in there? What you can expect, what's developmentally appropriate? Um, what their brains are doing biologically that we can kind of help 
um, reframe our approach knowing a little bit more about the biology. Um, the, some of the factors behind the rising anxiety and depression in kids, it is really skyrocketing, and I've got some statistics about that. Um, what parents can do to help, and I've got some sprinkles of DBT in here. Um, and because uh, for me, even if I'm seeing a client that is not a quote unquote DBT client, especially with teenagers, a lot of the DBT informs the work that I do. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and then how to learn more. So this is just kind of like a, you know, whet your appetite kind of thing. And we've got flyers out here about um, some of the other services, uh, weekend workshops, uh, seminar series for parents, uh, programs for the kids as well. So. Stay tuned for more. So, to get started, they are right, it is harder being a teenager today. Things are very different. And so I'm gonna kind of talk along with my DBT a little bit in these little quadrants. So, developmentally, what's going on with them, right? So we've got a lot more chronic stress with kids. And when we have chronic stress, our bodies react by increasing our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, right? And there are, so there, the kids these days are getting flooded with cortisol and it's very, and it's constant for them. You know, when we were kids, we got home, we got off the bus. If we didn't want to deal with anybody from school, we could just like not answer the phone, right? And kind of sit around and, and do nothing for a little bit. And they don't really have that luxury now. They're, they're having to constantly be on for a number of different reasons. Um, so it's a constant kind of flood of that stress hormone. So it does impact our brain development, especially at this really critical time in development. Um, brain development in teens is the, f so brains are developing at a rate only outpaced by infancy. So their brains are rapidly growing, rapidly building new neural connections. Right, and it doesn't look like, like we don't see that it's really happening because usually they're, they're grown at a certain point. You know, they're all bigger than I am, right? So it's all happening in, inside their brains, how rapidly this is, this is building. This is why they need more sleep. This is why they eat everything in that you bought at the grocery store, like within 12 hours. They're, they're just really like building neural connections. Um, so sleep shifts. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. I am on a mission about uh, school start times and by the neurobiology of kids. Um, increased emotional sensitivity. And we've all, if you have a teenager, you've seen the increased emotional sensitivity, haven't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Buckle up, right? So I've got a lot of strategies about how to respond to that. Okay, like when, when you just kind of stepped on a landmine, you have no idea what just happened what to do in those moments, okay? Um, social, there's a lot of social factors. There's this immediate gratification, kind of like what I was talking about, where they have to constantly be on with their peers. Lots of overscheduling, and there's a whole lot of stuff out with vaping, juuling, dab pens, you know. Um, I don't know if anybody went to, um, there was a presentation by Dr. Ruth Poti a couple months ago up at Algonquin about substances in adolescence, and that just like blew my mind. And so I stole a little bit with her permission, of course. Um, and then educational, you know, in, in a lot of high performing schools, there's a lot of pressure to keep up, right? Kids are taking way more AP classes at way younger ages than their brains are really ready for. Um, you know, when I was in high school, there was one AP class. Of course, that was a main, so you really kind of had to, you know, take what you get. But um, there's a lot of, additional resources that a lot of kids are feeling pressure to participate in in order to kind of keep up, right? Um, and then there's, there's a kind of a um, societal factor about decreased mindfulness that's happening because we're so busy all the time. We're not able to just kind of stop and tune in, right? And to slow down and just take a minute and be inside our own you know, selves. And so when we're so busy kind of playing whack-a-mole in life, we're not able to really, you know, reduce that cortisol level in our brains. So it's a constant, constant stress. And what a lot of, so we're losing our mindfulness strategies and um, 
and, and then there's a lot of um, societal factors about painful emotions, right? In our world right now, a lot of um, the world kind of says that feeling um, sad or anxious is kind of, um, you've got to fix it, right? So the message is that, well, then it must be bad if we have to fix it, right? And then so there's this, you know, um, message that we have to get rid of these painful emotions. We should only feel happy, and if we don't feel happy, there's something wrong with us, right? So in my work, I'm really trying to reframe people's thinking. And for a lot of us as parents, this is us being able to tolerate our own discomfort, watching the kids experience discomfort, and knowing that they can tolerate it and they can build some skills and strategies, and we can teach them how to do it, not jump in and, and kind of do it for them. So how do we do that? So we're going to talk about that. All right. With me so far? Excellent. Okay. So there's a lot of stuff coming out now that has kind of been growing exponentially in recent years. As a clinician, my alarm bells are going off. Um, there is a much higher rate of suicidality in teens happening much younger self-harming behaviors, usually cutting, but could also be burning, scratching, picking at skin, um, substance abuse, risky behaviors, all kinds of different things that are happening to kind of avoid painful emotions. Those are usually the reasons behind it. Um, self-harming behaviors are just exploding. It's, it's really significant. Um, we're seeing a lot of it and across all demographics of kids. Like we're seeing a lot of kids coming in now who are the high performing, straight A, AP, three sports, and those, ki those kids are engaging in self-harming behaviors because they're so stressed out. It's the only way that they've figured out how to self-regulate right now. So it's everywhere. So um, we have, I think, nine, eight or nine adolescent specific DBT skills groups. And they are full. So I'm, I'm working to build more groups. So these groups meet once a week for an hour, and it takes a year to go through the full curriculum of DBT. What we do find is that when they're done the curriculum, they won't leave. So we're doing something right. Yeah, they're learning these skills and strategies about how to self-regulate, how to tolerate distress, how to be mindful, how to be interpersonally effective. And there there's such concrete strategies that um, that this, for a lot of kids, you know, at, you know, the end of the year, maybe they've cut back on their individual therapy or uh, maybe they're done their individual therapy altogether, but they keep coming to group because that's kind of their touchstone about the thing to kind of get them, you know, mindful and remember a skill and a strategy and know that you have the, the ability to manage what's going on. So give them the tools and techniques. Um, we are seeing a lot of kids coming back from college at a bigger rate. So, um, and we're, we're trying to figure out why that is. Seems like a lot of those kids, um, you know, haven't built up the resiliency just through the nature of how the world is right now. And, and when they have to kind of go out and be on their own and figure things out independently, it shuts them down. They get overwhelmed and they get panicked, and then they, they really kind of turtle. So we're seeing a lot of them come back. Um, I probably get six or eight calls a week about kids who've come back from college um, due to stress um, and increasing demand for therapy services. Um, like I said, we have 25 therapists. Everybody works nights or weekends in some capacity. I had, you know, I had to close my wait list because it was over a year long and people were still adding their names. So, um, you know, being able to get access to therapy services, it's, and Massachusetts is the number one in the country about access to therapy services, if, if you would believe it. Um, but for kids, especially, or anything after school, it's, it's a challenge. So, usually I get a call from Sarah. She's like, please take this one. Right. So, more alarm bells for us as therapists, right? And for us as a, as a community, you know, suicide is now the second leading cause of death in kids 10 to 24. That only happened in like 2010, 2011, when it became from third 
the second leading cause of death, only outpaced by accidents. So something's going on. Um, we're seeing that one in five middle schoolers, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, have considered suicide. Self-harming behaviors, anytime I'm doing an intake with a kid for DBT group or therapy in general, if they're self-harming, I can, you know, once I kind of hear them present what's going on a little bit, I can kind of guess when this started for them. Typically middle school, usually seventh grade. There's something developmentally where their brain is kicking on some new processes that they don't have the skill set to be able to handle the emotions that they're getting flooded with, right? So this is what we're starting to see. Um, and then the suicide rate for girls especially has tripled since 2000 to 2018. So when we were trained at a, you know, in therapy school, you know, they would say uh, if we're doing a risk assessment with kids, especially, or even adults, if you were a female, it was a protective factor, right? So it would kind of shift our risk assessment a little bit. Um, but that's out the window now. So, so being a female is not a protective factor against suicide anymore. So, so this is why we're on high alert, right? This is why we're so busy. There's a lot going on. Okay, so into the developmental factor. So here's where I'm gonna get nerdy because this stuff is fascinating to me. Um, and not just me, there are a lot of people, Scientific American, right, the amazing teen brain. So it's really cool the research that's coming out now about what's happening during adolescent development. So during puberty, in that seventh grade year, right, somewhere around that seventh grade year. It's different for everybody. Sometimes we have late bloomers. Sometimes we have um, even to the effects of precocious puberty. We see when puberty is really, really young. Um, when we see that, I can almost peg that that particular kid, if they hit puberty younger than their peers, is m gonna have some emotion dysregulation issues somewhere because their brains just aren't ready for the flood of, of hormones that are hitting it, right? So your amygdala and your hippocampus, two things that are about your fight or flight and your emotion regulation, those kick into high gear when you hit puberty. So everything's a big deal. The emotions are so much bigger. And I remember waking up one time in middle school and just having this devastated feeling of the world is not what I thought it was. Right? I don't know if anybody else had that similar experience of what, what is happening in the world. right? And so, so there is something biological here. Um, a lot of the kids, it's happening earlier. Um, a lot of the kids are not prepared emotionally for what they're about to go through. right? And we all do the best we can. And there's a lot of uh, work in school about prepping them as well, um, but it's complicated. So, the, and the issue is with the emotions, like we all have emotions, we all have strong emotions, some of us stronger than others, and I'm gonna get into that in a second. But our frontal lobe, which is the part of the brain that's basically the brakes, it's the part of the brain that says, hold on, let me make sure I've got all the information I really need to know to make a decision. Um, how, if I do this behavior, how is it going to impact me tomorrow, next week, next month, right? Do I, can I analyze the information I'm getting? That part of the brain is the youngest part of the brain developmentally. It's the last part of the brain to come online, okay? So when you get these years between 12 and that, that frontal lobe is fully formed 25, 26. So we've got more than a decade of time where it's all gas, no brakes, right? The emotions are going at a huge level and the filter is just not built yet, right? And it's not anything that they've done wrong. It's not anything that they should know by now. Even when they're bigger than you are, their brain hasn't come online with this part yet, right? So, so there's this disconnect in the brain's ability to to filter, right? So, so that's something that I really want a lot of parents to kind of be aware of, that their brain just isn't operating at the same levels that ours are, right? So, 
And then the chronic cortisol exposure from the ongoing stress, what it does is it damages how the hippocampus, which is your emotion regulation, your emotion center, and your amygdala, which is your fight or flight or freeze, it kind of, it damages how they work, right? So they're not, they're getting flooded and it's almost like when you eat a lot of sugar and you get kind of porous teeth because it kind of, you know, eats away at what's in there. So that's how the stress impacts brain development. Things aren't getting built up in the way that they could be getting built up, right? Because of the chronic cortisol exposure. What's that? Can be can be the brain is is you know if you've heard neuroplasticity so the brain can recover from a lot of this stuff this is a really imperative time though during adolescence things are growing exponentially and the things that got hardwired now are going to be hardwired long term you know not for you know we can still kind of make changes DBT was initially developed for adult women who had been suicidal, self-harming, um, very disruptive relationships for a long, long, long time. And DBT has been shown to change how the brain works and change how people are regulating emotions. So people aren't, it's not a lost cause, right? Um, when people come into DBT, it was initially developed for something called borderline personality disorder. When, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if somebody got diagnosed with borderline, that was kind of like the, you know, nobody would touch that person. It was kind of like the, the write-off, like this person's beyond hope. But with DBT and with a lot of the um, cognitive restructuring that comes with it, we're able to see that people's brains do change. So people, I think at fancy places like Harvard where they have boatloads of money, they'll do like a, a pre-DBT functional MRI and then a post-DBT functional MRI and you can actually see brain differences in adults. So it's great to get it online with kids now because that'll, it'll impact them the rest of their lives and it's not, it's not the only window of opportunity. So does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, in a long-winded way. Okay. Um, oh, and I talked about that. Look at that. Patterns built during adolescence get hardwired. So, perfect. Okay, any questions about the brain? There's a lot more going on, but that's kind of a high-level high view. Yes? I'm sorry, I had one of those emotional calls while you were talking about this. Yes, yes. <laughs> perfect. You're in the right place. <laughs> My favorite part of yes. the whole talk. Um, can you just explain how the um, amygdala and hippocampus get damaged with the cortisone again? Yeah, cortisol. Said something specific. Right, right, right. right. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's, a little bit of it, it's kind of like everything, you know, everything in moderation. A little bit of cortisol, it's, it's supposed to stress us so we focus, right? When we're in a situation where we really need to attend to something or we're in danger or, or um, something's problematic and we need to be alert, right? But when the cortisol is constant, it can actually, and I don't know exactly the mechanism, but it, it does damage how things get built and how it gets connected and it can kind of pare back a little bit the the neural connections in those parts of the brain so yep when you, when you say patterns, patterns yep. built in patterns built in neural patterns so how the brain works is that what fires together wires together Right, so when we have thought patterns, when we have behavioral patterns, when we have ways of um, thinking or looking at the world, we, set, we create these neural connections, right? And every time we think that, it gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced until it becomes habit, right? Just think about like walking, learning to walk. We really had to work to learn to walk, right? We don't really think about it now because it's so hardwired. Right, so, so this is kind of how those patterns get developed. They get connected that way. Yep, all right, gotta move on. Got a lot to go through. Okay, developmental factors, sleep. I have a soapbox about sleep. Teens, because of how rapidly their brains are developing, they need nine to 10 hours of sleep every night. How many hours of sleep are your teens getting? Six, if they're lucky, right? And what time are they getting up? 6 a.m., 5.30. Yeah, when I was in high school, I had an hour-long bus ride, Maine, again. 
Um, so I was up at quarter to five every morning. So that could be all at night or can they sleep um, for parts of the day? So here's how sleep works for teens. So melatonin, which is our sleep chemical, for us as grown-ups, ostensibly, right? So, you know, we start feeling tired around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, right? So that's when our melatonin starts kicking in. For teens, the melatonin starts shifting later. So your teen might be exhausted, but they're not going to bed, and it's 11.30 at night. What the heck is happening? You're going to be exhausted tomorrow morning. Their brains aren't letting them. The melatonin isn't being released yet, and that's developmental, right? So the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2014 recommended that teens not have school before, I think, 8.30 in the morning because if you need that 9 to 10 hours and your brain's releasing melatonin around midnight, 11 o'clock midnight, how much sleep do you need? You need a lot more than what you're getting. Some of the kids aren't getting half the amount of sleep that they're getting. Right now, how, how do you function on a day of half the sleep that you should be getting? Right now, imagine it being chronic. Right, so sleep deprivation is a form of torture in the Geneva Convention. Why are we doing this to our kids? Right, they need the sleep and they need it when their biology tells them to sleep. Could they nap? Yeah, they do basically out of sheer exhaustion, but it's not that restorative sleep that they really need to help really. Um, help their brain get built and help um, pull out the neurotoxins that happen with, um, with brain development activity. So just kind of like a muscle, when you work out, you get that lactic acid built up in your muscle. It takes a while for it to kind of get um, you know, removed. The brain does the same thing, right? So there's a chemical, and I forget the name of it all. Is it? Adenosine, that's the one. So, it gets built up in brains as we're using a lot of effort in brains and the sleep is the thing that cleans it out. So for them it's getting built up because they're not getting enough sleep. So that, I have a big soapbox about that. The brain's still getting wired. We did talk about that. Ooh, synaptic pruning. Okay, so this is fun. So as much as the teen brains are developing, they're also getting pruned back at an exponential rate too. So because there are things that they needed during earlier development that they don't need anymore. It's kind of like um, learning a language and having an accent or not having an accent. If you're exposed to a, a language earlier in life, you, usually prior to age four or five, and you, can't, you learn that language, you won't have an accent. But if it's after that level, because a different part of the brain has clicked in, right, that the language absorption part of the brain goes offline. So you're going to have an accent if you learn a language later than that age. So what the brain does is it starts pruning back things it doesn't really need developmentally anymore. And so for teens, their brains are getting pruned at a rate of, I believe that it was, um, Dr. Poti said, 300,000 synapses per second. So that's a lot of pruning happening at the same time. Um, and the substances that kids are using if kids are using a lot of weed, marijuana, the THC in that actually mirrors the, um, uh, what's it called? I had a brain. Adenosine, is it the adenosine? So it's a chemical that pairs back um, the synaptic um, connections. So, it, and it does it at an exponential rate. So it over prunes because of the extra THC. So, so it's, it's something to be aware of, right? Okay, higher sensitivity to emotions. We talked about that. The amygdala and hippocampus are on fire. They are on fire. So the emotions are going to be bigger, right? Okay. So within, within sleep, right? Yes. Do you see any, you showed some trends. Is there any trends that says, that show other kids are getting enough like REM sleep as well within, within sleep? Or is it, is there any trends that say, so the longer the sleep, the more REMs they get. So a cycle takes 90 minutes generally. So if they can squeeze in you know, enough REM cycles through the night, that's better. The more they can squeeze in, the better. Um, and there's a lot of data coming out about schools that have pushed their start times back and less anxiety in kids. They're doing pre-test, post-test, less anxiety, less depression, 
more school attendance, better grades, 37% decrease in car accidents for schools that have start times later. So there's a sleep is so, so crucial right now, right? Just like when they were infants, right? If they missed a nap, <laughs> everybody's life was torturous, right? Kind of the same right now. Pretty the same right now. So here's a sprinkle of DBT, right? And to me, this is pretty much every teenager walking the planet, right? So some of us are built, so this is the biosocial theory about how emotions are developed, okay? So some of us have a higher sensitivity to emotions than other people. We have smaller and more densely packed amygdalas. Amygdalas come in all shapes and sizes, right? So those of us who have a higher sensitivity to emotion, we're, we're the therapists, we're the artists, we're the writers, the musicians, the theater people, right? Anything that's creative, emotionally driven. Um, our amygdalas are smaller and more densely packed. We feel bigger. We feel more strongly than other people do. We have a superpower. And that's how I frame it to the kids that I work with, is that because you have these high sensitivity to emotions, because you feel something that somebody else is experiencing, that deep, deep, deep empathy, but they haven't figured out how, what's theirs and what's somebody else's and how to kind of have a boundary between those things, they take it on, right? So we have a high sensitivity to emotion. We have a high reactivity because we feel bigger, we're gonna respond bigger. And it takes us longer to kind of come down, right? So when I realize that this is how I'm built, basically, and I'm married to an engineer. Do we have any engineers in the room? <laughs> back there right anybody know some engineers right very logical very fact-based right so my husband has looked at me within the past few months at times and said your emotions are irrational right and to him they are because he literally doesn't feel the depth of emotion that I do right and so we can translate this to the kids and know that they're feeling at a deeper level than we are Right, just because we're in, we have you know the uh, the benefit of you know years of experience to say you know this one thing is not going to destroy you, but to them it feels like it will. Right, so that emotion that they're experiencing is their truth. It may not make sense, but it's their truth. Right, so we got to work within that parameter. Okay, um, and the social environment can be really negating. Like my husband who you know, with best of intentions said, your emotions are irrational. He was trying to get me to kind of like come down a little bit and talk about things logically, right? Um, and luckily I'm pretty, you know, I can self-regulate and I'm very mindful about my own experiences and I know to manage my own emotions. But when I was younger and before I knew about this stuff, I might've said to myself, those of us who have a high sensitivity to emotion, we say to ourselves, oh, I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's something wrong with what I'm feeling, right? And now we feel anxious and now shameful, right? So we get this layer of emotional, ugh, right? And we don't know what to do with it, right? So this is where this pervasive emotional dysregulation comes from a lot with teenagers because it seems like they, they're going to avoid the emotion, avoid the emotion, avoid the emotion until kaboom. Or the emotion shuts them down. Right? Those are the ones I call my fainting goats. Have you seen those YouTubes, right, where the, the goats are scared and they, they lock up and fall over, right? That's school avoidance, by the way, right there. Their amygdalas are so um, overstimulated that it's the fight, flight, or freeze mechanism, right? That's school avoidance. That's what that is, right? So by knowing how the brains operate, we can be able to kind of coach kids a little bit differently. And this high sensitivity group, us therapists and artists and writers and designers, right? We're about seven to nine percent of the population, just in general, right? But again, it's the vast majority of teenagers, because again, that's the part of their brain that's online right now. Okay. All right. So what happens with this pervasive emotional dysregulation? You're going to see this with the kids if they haven't figured out how to regulate themselves yet. They're going to do this self-invalidation. I shouldn't be feeling this way. There's something wrong with me because I'm feeling this way. I should be able to just stop how I'm feeling. I should be able to enjoy this. Why aren't I happy right now? I have everything I could ever want. What's wrong with me? Right? So they've internalized this invalidation that the world just generally gives us. 
And if we have a higher sensitivity to emotion, we're going to get it in spades, right? Uh, um, you know, we, kids hear all the time, you're too sensitive. So now they're being told there's something wrong with their emotion, their emotional perception, right? So reframing it like a superpower is really, you know, empowering for them. Um, so they start to, like, believe this about themselves. There's something wrong with me because of how much emotion I'm having, right? So we teach them how to do otherwise. Um, all or nothing thinking. So this is the avoidance. This is too painful. I'm going to shut this down, right, until it becomes a crisis. And if I'm not perfect, I'm a failure. If this person didn't text me back right away, they hate me, right? We get this extreme kind of thinking patterns in kids. And so this is what DBT really works with to kind of pull people in from these extremes. What's the truth in this side and what's the truth in this side? It's not all or nothing. It's a little bit of both and. Can we find the middle ground here somewhere, right? And so that's what the treatment that I do really helps people think about. Avoidance of emotions like we talked about. Right? A lot of kids are getting the message from the world that they shouldn't ever feel upset. If, there's, if they're upset, that means something's wrong, it needs to be fixed, make it go away. Right? Whether it's, you know, trash talk somebody online, whether it's, you know, um, uh, like immediately go talk to a teacher to make the emotions go away, um, scream at your parent to make the emotions go away. They, they feel like they have to get rid of these emotions. They're not able to allow them to happen because our emotions are trying to communicate stuff to us, right? It's trying to give us a message of what's going on with our environment, what we're perceiving, how we're interpreting things. And, you know, emotions evolved in the human brain before language did, right? So who has a pet? You can tell how your pet's feeling, right? Your pet can tell how you're feeling. If you're sad, they come snuggle up, right? No, we're not talking to each other in like a, a, you know, solid discourse. We feel it with each other, right? So they're learning how to kind of regulate that themselves. And if they're getting the message that they shouldn't feel pain, that they should just shut it down and avoid it, it's going to explode, right? So this is what we're hearing with a lot of kids coming in right now. This is the message that they're getting. So teaching them how to sit in their discomfort, which is really hard for us as parents to watch your kid be uncomfortable and sit with them through it and not fix it for them that's so uncomfortable and it's what they need to do because if we go in there and we fix it for them what message are we giving them that we don't think they can do it themselves right so how do we give them the tools and how do we use our own tools to regulate so we can help them regulate more on that later Okay, labeling and judging. That's kind of an all or nothing thinking kind of a thing, emotional. Um, so emotion mind, you guys have seen this. Emotion mind is the point, the state of mind where you're in crisis. The decisions you're making are based on your emotions only. There's no logic, there's no reason, there's no strategy. You're just ready to explode or implode, right? We've all witnessed this in teenagers, yeah? Yeah, this was me like earlier today even, right? We all experience this. And just knowing what it is and what we do in Emotion Mind, we're gonna talk about skills to, to help coach kids to do, to bring them out of that Emotion Mind place. So that rational, reasonable mind, that's kind of the opposite side. Logic, facts, data, um, analytics. My husband lives there, right? My engineer husband, that's, that's, his, that's his skill set right there. Right? I'm pretty much wired to be an emotion mind. So together we make wise mind. It's a nice marriage, right? That's helpful as long as we recognize the value in the other, right? So when kids come into DBT and adults come into DBT, oftentimes these states of mind aren't even touching. They're like, I got to do this. I got to do this. Oh my God, I can't take it anymore. And like, no, can't, can't do this. I got to blah, 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 right? And we've all kind of done this ping ponging back and forth. That's the all or nothing thinking. And you probably have seen this with the kids. So how do we get them to blend the two? Because the emotions matter and the facts matter. So how can we walk this middle path where we're making our decisions in a place where we've thought through all the consequences of our choices, right? So we gotta get out of emotion mind in order to do that. So more on that in a bit. With me so far? I'm going really fast, I'm sorry. If you wanna learn more, come take my class. All right, societal factors. So this is stuff that you guys are seeing, the social media thing. 
huge. There's a book, iGen, Jean Twenge. She talks about how, so she, she researched the rise of anxiety and depression in kids. And it was going up, going up, going up. And then 2007, that's when the iPhone came out. So their brains are getting rewired, right? And there's a lot of data coming out about this. That when we look at each other, when we make eye contact, we're releasing serotonin in each other's brains, right? It's the human connection. It's the thing that bonds us, right? It feels good to be connected, right? So I'm releasing everybody's serotonin right now. It's kind of creepy, right? Yeah, it's a little creepy, right? So, but what's happening with, <laughs> not to be awkward, but maybe a little. So what's happening with the kids though, is they're not getting the serotonin release from people. They're getting the serotonin release from how many likes they got. Who's made a comment? right who's who's you know sharing their stuff who's commenting who's their friend now right and that instant gratification of how many likes i got that's rewiring where their brain is getting serotonin so it's becoming an addiction right this is why we're seeing so many kids that you know we ask them to go hey can you go run into the store and you know go return this item for me and they're like Wah. right it's like we're asking them to you know Across the Atlantic in a canoe, right? But th it's this terror that they have of this interpersonal reaction because their brains aren't built for this anymore. They're losing the ability to really have that connection with other humans. It's coming from a machine right now. So if you want to read more about that, read Gene Twenge. It's fascinating and terrifying. See the dialect there? Um, yeah, and so they're getting burned out with this overscheduling that a lot of them are doing. You know, the kids are go, 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 go. Um, I don't know if people know in Japan, there's this um, concept of karoshi, which is death by overwork, because people in Japan are expected to work 60, 70, 80 hour, more hours a week. And that's just how the culture is over there. And what happens is people get so overstimulated and so overworked, their brains will literally stop. So if they're not sleeping, if you don't sleep for three, four days, you will die. Your brain will stop functioning. It gets poisoned by all the, the byproducts of the um, neural activity going on in there, right? And people are suiciding at an exponential rate. So they're classifying the, these suicides and these, these deaths of heart attacks, strokes that are happening to people in their 30s and 20s as Karoshi, this death by overwork, right? So we want to be careful with how much stress our kids are under too. Um, and then vaping and substance abuse. I already talked about the THC. Um, and the endamide, there it is. I knew it was in there somewhere. It, that's the chemical that is about the pairing, the, the pairing back of neural connections. And the THC um, replicates it. So they're getting flooded with it if they're using a lot of weed. And what the weed does is it doesn't let them build up the strategies to cope with the emotions themselves internally. They're relying on a substance, right? So sometimes we um, encourage kids and adults too, you know, sometimes we'll, we'll go to people to make us feel better or some people turn food or substances or wine or whatever, right? We're allowing something else to comfort us versus our, us comforting ourselves, right? So we want to teach the kids that they have the ability to self-regulate to tolerate these emotions, to hear what the emotions are trying to say, and then cope with them effectively. Not close them out, not run away from them, that's not helping, let them happen. Which they look at me like I've got three heads when I'm like, okay, you're sad, yeah, let's feel sad. And they're like, what? Aren't you supposed to make it better? No, that's not my job, right? My daughter says she thinks that um, I help people with their feelings by telling them not knock jokes. I find it super cute. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. Right, okay, educational factors, we all see it. These MCAS tests, these standardized tests, the APs, the huge amount of pressure, um, you know, to put things on your college application. Um, you know, we've all been hearing about the college application scandal lately in the news. There's all this pressure and high performing anxiety. Like people, I got into a, um, conversation about someone um, that lived in the town I grew up in and they were talking about um, the school start times being an excuse and I was like actually 
here's how brains work and here's the kids coming into my office are the high performing high anxiety AP level kids you know they're, they're suffering right and the educational system is really kind of pouring it on as well um, so the expectations of schools so I actually consult for another local school and they have career exploration conversations in fifth grade yeah talk about pressure you're 10 years old you need to figure out what you're going to do for the rest of your life right and that's that's what the kids hear right when i was in fifth grade i wanted to be a rock star still right i was through sort of like maybe junior year in high school maybe but that didn't work out but, and then the emotional support. So these um, adjustment counselors in schools, they're so overworked. Their job is to get kids back to their class as quickly as possible. They're the firefighters. They're not doing deep therapy in school. They're just trying to band-aid it, fix it, get back in school. That's what the, the administration's message is. is <coughs> get back to class, get back to class, get back to class. Right, so they're not given the, the ability to kind of explore some of the stuff that's going on for them. And there's a statistic that 80% of the kids that have diagnosed mental health issues are not getting treatment. So, but they're in the school, right? So there's a real significant population of kids who are struggling with anxiety, depression, attention, you know, grief, you name it, and they're not getting the services they need, right? So this is kind of a emerging mental health crisis with our kids. Um, Fear of failure and discomfort, to feel shame, guilt, and sadness, etc., is kind of being portrayed as bad in our culture right now, right? If you're anxious, you shouldn't feel anxious, right? So how are you going to, you know, let's get rid of those emotions real quick. Let's fix it, right? You don't have to keep taking this class because it's uncomfortable for you. We'll let you kind of drop out of it. Right? Or there's a lot of different things that are going on. Schools are doing this. We're doing this as a community. Um, fear of failure, the FOMO, fear of missing out. If you don't know that acronym already, it's kind of over now, but um, you know, that kids are feeling like they have to only experience joy. You know, there's something wrong with them if they're feeling sad. There's something wrong with them if they're feeling anxious. None of their friends are feeling this way. What's wrong with me? Right? So, and then these fears of failure, yeah, I have these kids that come in and if they get a 90 on a test instead of a 100, it's a meltdown, right? They're not learning from their failures about, okay, let me strategize how to do, how to study differently next time or, you know, I didn't get a full night's sleep because I was up all night studying, look how that worked out. They're not able to strategize about that. A failure means it's devastating. It's devastating to them right now. So we've kind of um, reduced the effectiveness of failures. You know, so when I'm in, in therapy with a client and, um, you know, I want them to explore some of the failures that they've had and I want to celebrate it because you learned, right? And I talk about, you know, scientists, when they have a hypothesis and they go into the lab and they test their hypothesis and it's completely wrong. They get so excited, woohoo, right? Because that was data. They learned, right? And so I'm, I'm trying to work with my clients about, hey, that was a spectacular fail. Okay, what can we take from that, right? Yeah, that sucks, that's really painful. Let's sit in that discomfort for a while because that's trying to teach us something, right? That's the lesson right there that maybe we need to look, about, look at this a little bit differently next time, right? So there's a lot of this fear of fa failure though. Lawnmower, snowplow parenting, I don't know if you guys have heard this phrase. So this is the, the, the college admission scandal kind of a thing where our parents are kind of plowing the roads for kids, like removing all kinds of obstacles for them so they don't ever have to face a failure or an obstacle th themselves. The parents will make everything you know, easy for the kid. And so then when the kids kind of get out there in the world and they have an obstacle and they have no resiliency built in because they've never had the chance to fail. They've never had the chance to 
learn from their mistakes. They've never had the, because the parents have swooped in and kind of protected them from it, right? So it's a real, and it's a really hard thing that we have to do as parents to kind of step back and let them step in it, right? It's really kind of scary for us to do. And it's better for us to do it now while they're here at home versus they, it happens when they're out at college or out in the world and they have less of a safety net with us around there, right? So it's really kind of scary for a lot of parents right now too. So, and the message that they're getting when the parents kind of jump in and do things for them is that, oh, I must not be able to do it for myself. So they start internalizing that. So we want to give them the tools and the techniques to say, okay, give this a try, see what happens. If you fall, I'm here. Or you gotta take the leap, right? Um, and then this is really disheartening and scary, the massacre generation. Um, there was a college student, I forget what college she was going to, but she wrote an article for, I think, The New Yorker um, about and, and calling her generation the massacre generation. This is how they're self-defining now with the school shootings. Like the, We didn't grow up with this stuff, right? I was in grad school when Columbine happened, right? I was nearly a fully functional adult, right? But this is how they, they're doing these drills at school, starting in preschool, kindergarten. There, there's this constant fear of danger for them and they're getting flooded in this. So it's, it's impacting their emotional abilities to regulate, right? So it's scary for them to think about. Okay, action time, action items. What can parents do? Thank you, oh, look at my timing. I'm so impressed with myself, 30 minutes to go, okay. That's exactly where I was hoping to be. All right. Okay. So what can parents do? Now that I've kind of terrified everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> My bad. Right? Here's what to do to help. Yay. Okay. Right? We'll have a good half hour to talk about it. And maybe a smidge more, depending on question and answer. Okay. Validation is huge. Validation is crucial for their emotional growth right now. You know, a lot of times I'll have kids come in or um, I was talking with um, my PCP the other day. I was in having a physical and she, and she was like, what do I do with my teenager? She knows what I do. You know, you mean I shouldn't just say, well, suck it up? I'm like, N -n -n. I mean, with some kids you can. With some kids you can. With the sensitive kids, it's totally going to backfire, right? So because then they start questioning, well, I shouldn't feel this way. What's wrong with me? Da -da -da, right? And they start invalidating themselves. So we have to teach them how to self-validate. And we model that for them, right? So, and I'm gonna get into this a little more in depth about what to say, what not to say. So stay tuned for that, okay? So it reduces the emotional suffering. It acknowledges painful emotions. Instead of trying to fix them and say we shouldn't feel that way, it says, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, I, I bet you were really upset about that. And then you sit in it with them and everybody gets a little squirmy, right? But that's the thing that teaches them that their emotion makes sense, right? That it's okay to feel that, right? So dialectic, so this is the DBT, thinking about those, um, pulling back from that all or nothing thinking that tends to happen. If I'm not perfect, I'm a failure. Well, that's gonna be a problem on both sides, isn't it? Nobody can live up to being perfect. And if you're t defining yourself as a failure, that's gonna be, pretty torturous too, right? So how do we kind of find the truth in both sides? One of the most important things I teach parents is that when you're kind of talking with a kid, uh, a lot of us will kind of start to validate and say, well, yeah, I can see how you'd be really upset about that, but did you think about it this way, right? But what does the kid hear? But. The but, right? Which invalidates the whole first part of that sentence, right? We get a review at work. You did really great on this task, but you really got to work at that. What do you hear? You hear you suck, right? Right. So th the way to reframe that for kids and think dialectically, think about the truth on both sides, which gets them unstuck from rigid thinking, is to say, hey, you did really well on this part, and I think we got to look at this a little bit more, right? So take the word but completely out of your lingo when talking to your kids and replace it with the word and, because both sides are true. They worked really hard and this didn't go so well, 
both sides are true, right? But the they feel invalidated, and I feel invalidated if somebody says, hey, you did great with that, but, you know, not to be rude, but, you know, we, we, this is part of our culture, right? And again, with a lot of kids, this isn't necessary. If you have a high sensitivity kid, this is really gonna help you because they're gonna be able to hear you through the whole conversation, okay? Responding to the emotions, not the words, right? So a kid comes at me with high intensity. There are a lot of families where the parent, and I've run parent groups where parents have said, um, you mean it's, I shouldn't be addressing every word that comes out of their mouth and counterpoint and, and kind of challenging their beliefs and stuff. And I'm like, that. well, later, not in that moment. When they're in that emotion mind that we talked about earlier where the emotions are running the show, that's not the time to try to use reason and logic. That part of their brain isn't online right now. They're being run by their amygdalas. So if you can look at the emotion and ignore the words, kind of like when they were toddlers, right? You know, my, when my kids were little, mommy, I hate you, right? That didn't devastate, I mean, it sucked, but it didn't devastate me because I knew that that was about the emotion, not really what they were trying to say to me, right? And it's still how it is with teenagers. They have a little bit more um, nuanced language, perhaps, but the... <laughs> But it's about the emotion, not the words, okay? And then letting them problem solve. And we I talked about this a little bit ago. Kind of taking a step back and letting them figure out what's the best course of action for them. It's letting them self-regulate so they're operating by what's true for them, not by what you, sh you think they should do. So my nine-year-old came home from school today and she got invited to a birthday party with a good friend. And then she was like, oh, maybe I'm not gonna go because this other girl it, has been invited and she's not very nice to me. And so I said, okay, well, so what are your options, right? Before DBT, I would have said, oh, well, let's call the girl's mom and da 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 and let's you know, set up a play date so we can work this all out, right? But that would have been me fixing her problem for her. And the message would have been, I don't trust you to, I mean, she's only nine, but still, like, start early, right? I don't trust you to be able to handle this on yourself, by yourself. So what I said to her was, okay, so what options do you have about this, right? That, that might be really uncomfortable. Validated the emotions, hey, yay me, tick, right? And then, okay, what are your options? You could do this. Her first option was to not talk to her at all. I'm like, you could, right? I call this emotional judo. When they come at you with the, like, most ridiculous idea, and you know, a lot of us will say, well, that's not, that, that's not reasonable. You can't do that, right? And then they're just gonna get dug in even more. Oh yeah, watch me, right? So you wanna do, like, I, I love the, the analogy of judo. So if anybody knows anything about martial arts, if the, the judo, oh, what happened? Ryan, did I not move forward? What happened? Mm, perhaps. Something's worrying, that's a good sign. Um, so being able to um, take what's being thrown at you and then just kind of go with the resistance is a phrase that we use a lot. So you could do that. You could not get out of bed for three days. You could. What's gonna happen? Right, instead of me coming in and saying, well, this would happen and this would happen and this would happen and me kind of directing the thought process, right? What, what would happen if you didn't get it? What would happen if you went to this party and you didn't talk to her the entire time you were there? Right, okay, so we figured out that one. What else could you do? And then what else could you do? So I wanna talk a little bit about the purpose of emotions, right? And I referenced this a little bit ago that em emotions job is to communicate something to us, right? Anxiety alerts us. Anger tells us that something's not fair or we're not being treated well, right? Shame tells us we did something really not so great, right? Or we're, there's something internally that doesn't feel good. Guilt is saying, don't do that again. That wasn't your best option. And joy says, hey, that was awesome, do more of that, right? Emotions have a job to do. And when we try to suppress them, we're not tuning into our own emotional experiences, right? So we really have to listen to them. And it's really scary. The hardest skill in all of DBT is this skill called the wave. 
And in the adult book, it's called Mindfulness of Current Emotions, which sounds lame. So we call it the wave in the adolescent book. And it's letting yourself experience the entirety of a peak and decline of emotions. You feel it coming up, you feel it at its crisis point, and you let it kind of come down, right? So my sister's a wallower, so she has a hard time letting go of the emotions, right? I like to kind of, you know, spin up pretty quickly, so I really escalate my emotions sometimes. Not that I like to, but it's how I'm built, right? And so that 20 to 30 minute time frame, that's usually the peak of the emotional intensity. That's when people are in that emotion mind. That is not the time to problem solve. That is not the time to reason. This is the time to really apply validation skills and distress tolerance skills, okay? So how can you get through this situation without making it worse? We're not making the pain go away. We're not fixing the problem. We're just trying to get through this half an hour. So I don't know if people have ever seen um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, but she talks about how when she's in, the, in the, the bunker there and she has to turn this wheel, like she just gets through 10 minutes and you can tolerate anything for 10 minutes, right? And so we kind of use that analogy. I'll sometimes show a clip with the kids, right? So the brains aren't working logically. Don't even try to reason with them when they're in that level of intensity. It's not gonna work and they're gonna feel invalidated. Right? So you want to do validation strategies. Oh, my movie. Let's see if this works. So talking about validation. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me. And I can just feel it. Like literally feel it in my head. And it's relentless. And I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just don't try to see things my way. Do I have to keep Does that sound familiar to anybody? <laughs> right, so that's a classic example of invalidation that he was trying to do at first. He was trying to fix the problem, right? He was trying to make it better for her. But that's not what she needed in that moment. She was feeling, she was in emotion mind a little bit about it. She needed to process her emotions about the situation, not just make it go away, right? And did you see when he finally validated her, her emotions came down, right? So this is an extension of what we can do with the kids, not fix the problem for them or get them to fix it. But how do you feel about it? That must be really hard. Like join with them in the emotion that they're experiencing because that tells them it's okay. And then you can do something about problem solving, right? You gotta do the validation first in order to get to the problem solving, especially with the high sensitivity kids, right? Okay, here's some invalidating statements. They're really tiny on your handouts. I'm so sorry. You can take a picture if you want, right? So things that are invalidating, I understand. Take that out of your vocabulary, right? That's one of the things they taught us in therapy school. Don't ever say I understand. Therapy, you like that? <laughs> because we don't. How could we? How could we ever understand what somebody else's experience is? We can kind of empathize with it and we can kind of see how they might be feeling what they're feeling, but we don't understand, right? So take that out of your vocabulary. It's gonna help a lot more. Instead, say things like, let me make sure I hear what you're saying. That makes sense, right? 
I, I get where you're coming from. I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm smelling what you're stepping in. You know, there's all kinds of different ways you can phrase validating statements, right? And so there's a bunch of examples here. Um, I can see how that would be so upsetting. Where you feel, we can kind of um, take a guess about, you know, were you feeling kind of scared when that happened, right? Versus um, telling them how they were feeling, right? We don't want to tell them how they're feeling because we don't know, right? We can take a guess, but we might be wrong, right? And same with like being able to reframe what they're saying. Like I can validate somebody who says that they're seeing orange cupcakes in the sky, right? Orange cupcakes aren't there, but I can still validate the emotion, right? So let me make sure I'm seeing, you're saying that you're seeing this and that and the other thing and that this is where they're coming from and this is how you're feeling about it. Wow, that must be really scary. I wonder if that's kind of scary, right? then you validated, right? And the reality might be different, right? When a kid comes home and they're like, oh my God, I'm never going to college, I'm a failure forever, right? What's our first, imp our first impulse to say, no, 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 you're fine, you'll be fine, you'll, I'll help you, right? That invalidates their emotions. So you wanna go to, to like use the emotional judo and say, tell me more about that, what happened? Let me get some of the details. In the back of your head, you're like, they'll be fine. But you know, you gotta hang on to that. You can't jump to that right away. You, when you validate enough, you'll feel the energy shift, especially if you have the high sensitivity yourself, right? It's, it is genetic, the high sensitivity, right? We have the amygdalas that are smaller and more densely packed. Usually if we have a highly sensitive kid, you know, I'll ask the kid, okay, which one of your parents has a superpower too? And they're like, ah, <laughs> yep, yep, it is genetic. So, um, so things like calm down, take a deep breath, take a walk. Have you tried yoga? It's one of my favorites a minimization it tells people it should be easy for you to fix the way you're feeling right so we want to try to avoid that um, trying to problem solve too quickly when I was your age don't do that. you'll get the eye roll anyway which is a good sign of like don't do that again but um, it's not that big a deal what's the reason sometimes it's um, there are a lot of families that I work with where the parents will try to like isolate a particular situation, where did this come from, right? And they try to dig and try to dig and try to dig. And for a lot of kids, there is no place that they can identify where the emotion came from. It just came, right? And that's okay. Their amygdalas are doing some wacky things right now. So we can ride that wave with them and say, yeah, that's kind of funky when that happens, isn't it? Your amygdala is just having a dance party in there, huh? Right? And they're like, yes, annoying, right? And, and kind of normalize it, right? Be very gentle with normalize. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You shouldn't be depressed. You're, oh, should. No shoulds. Take the word should out of your language. No shooting on yourself. No shooting on others. Get it? Get it? Ha, ha, ha. Right? Because when we say should, what's, what's the message you're getting? There's a judgment. You should be happy about that, right? What you're feeling is not appropriate. You should be. There's a judgment. Right? So take that word out of your language as well. It's going to be really beneficial. Okay? All right. So in DBT, we talk about these levels of validation. So this is going to be really helpful. Levels of validation. Level one. So these get more, um, more intense the higher the level gets. Okay? Level one is basically staying awake. Right? So... I have a, a family that I've been working with, and the mother has this tendency to just kind of jump in and try to fix things for the kids, right? Because it distresses her so much to see her kids in pain, right? And we do this with the best of intentions, right? We don't want to see our kids suffering. So what she's historically done is kind of jumped in with her own anxiety, and the highly sensitive kid has picked up her anxiety, and then it's just spun up, right? So what we're working with this mom on doing is just coming into the kid's room and sitting on the bed and just sitting and just being present and bearing witness to her daughter's discomfort, right? And there's something very powerful in just that bearing witness, just being present. You don't need to fix it. You don't need to find a solution. You don't need to make it better, right? Just your presence is comfort enough, right? So when in doubt, just sit there. Okay, and that in and of itself is validating. If you wanna amp up the validation a little bit, you wanna do these nonverbals, right? Make sure your, your um, facial expressions are matching the 
emotions that are coming out. Um, there's these experiments, I think they were done at Boston University about um, parental mirroring with infants. And you can just Google this, an um, infant mirroring study. And, um, and it shows that there's a mother and an infant and um, we, we, as infants, we regulate our emotions by mir being mirrored by the adults around us, right? So there's this study where the mother's playing with the baby and then the um, experimenters have her just kind of like f go flat faced, like very non-expression and still be there. She's still present, but she's not doing the, oh, ah, you know, the facial expressions that we do with, with other people. And, and the kid flips out within 30 seconds because, you know, there's no, again, there's no deep discourse. But just the facial expressions and the tone and the body positioning and all of that mirrors emotions in a really powerful way, right? So this is why I will never get Botox because I have to have that, you know, <laughs> that like, wow, tell me your pain, you know, I'm, I'm here with you, right? Just from your face. I don't need to say the right thing. I don't need to fix it. But just me like having the, the communication on my face, right? 93% of communication is nonverbal. Only 7% of the communication we have is the actual words that we use. Everything else is tone, volume, pitch, um, body positioning, facial expressions, all that stuff, right? So that's where the majority of our communication is coming from. Reflecting and rephrasing. So this is saying just kind of, again, like with the orange cupcakes in the sky, right? You don't have to believe it. You don't have to think that they're uh, correct in what they're thinking. But if you can reflect back to them what it is that they're trying to tell you in an accurate kind of a way, what it shows is that you're listening. You've heard them. You're not agreeing with them, but you've heard them, right? And just like with the nail in the head, sometimes that's all we really need is just to be heard, right? So, and it's an opportunity for them to correct if you made you know, an assumption or you're, you're not getting a piece of the puzzle and, and that's helpful still, right? So you know, sometimes you know, it's one of the best therapeutic interventions is just to reflect, right? It's my number one validation strategy. So this is what happened and then you, know, you went back to the class and talked to the teacher and they were like that, wow, that sucks, right? That is huge because then they're like, yes, somebody gets me. And then you can move into problem solving, right? But you can't do that when they're still kind of escalated, okay? Speaking the unspoken and looking for patterns. So this is kind of like taking that reflection that you just did and extending it over time. So, wow, I bet that was really tough for you when you got that grade because I know three months ago you took that test and it didn't go so well. Oh, man, right? So it's showing that not only are you paying attention, but you've been paying attention this whole time right and being able to kind of dig into things a little bit I wonder did you feel kind of like this or did this thought kind of go through your head I could be wrong right but what it's showing is that you're really invested okay it's a deeper level of validation right okay normalizing is level five be very careful this isn't the when I was your age kind of a thing this is the you know I've really heard that this is happening a lot with kids right now this is the, you know, I went to this presentation at the library and oh my gosh, this is what a lot of kids are dealing with, huh? Right? Normalizing on a, like a global scale, not, you know, comparing yourself to the kids' experience. They're not, they don't want to hear that. So don't, right? So normalizing just generally with kids these days, right? And radical genuineness. So this is approaching a situation just as a human, right? Taking off your parent hat and kind of just being with them as just another human being on the planet. So my example of radical genuineness has always been, um, you know, I ha was working with this girl from another town and worked for like a year and a half on a pretty significant eating disorder. She got better, went off to college. I was still a little uncertain, so we set her up with another DBT therapist out where she was at college. Didn't fit, she tried somebody else, didn't fit, tried somebody else, and it was kind of okay. And then that person went away on vacation. And at, on her campus stuff, went down like she sent me this text message it must have been like five pages long of you know really significant stuff and classes and then campus police and you know 
reports to the police, this thing and that happening, and da 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 da. And it was like, I deal with a lot, and that was a lot for this kid. And so my, my response, and I might get in trouble, my response back to her, probably not the most therapeutic thing I've ever done, was all caps, holy shit balls. <laughs> because it was a lot and that was me just responding as a human right and it communicated to her that what she was experiencing was real and significant right just by those two words i don't know shit balls one word or two words i don't know but you know it could be three who knows but being able to say like me as a human and she came back at winter break and she came in to see me and she said that she had been on like the seventh floor of a parking garage contemplating whether to stay or go when she sent me that text message. So, you know, it doesn't have to be this deep, well thought through response that we have. It can just be connecting as, as your genuine self. And this doesn't mean necessarily swearing with them or not being somebody who you are naturally. Be yourself, right? You don't have to be like kooky like me. But all right, and then dialectus, this idea of getting unstuck. What's the truth in this side? What's the truth in this side? The main dialectic in DBT is this concept of we're all doing the very best we can, right? Even if a kid comes to me straight from the hospital, even if they were self-harming the night before, that's them still doing the very best they can. And we have a lot of validation and compassion for that because people are suffering, right? And so, and we're gonna acknowledge that suffering. And we got to do something different. What you've been doing up till now hasn't been working, has it, right? And this is what I'm saying with the kids in, in my, and adults in my office too. So we're doing the best we can and we got to do something different, right? There's no but in there. So we're validating both sides, right? So if you can kind of think about there's truth in this side, truth in that side, how can we kind of explore those? That's going to get the kids unstuck from that rigid all or nothing thinking that they get into, right? Um, no buts, shoulds, or understands. We went through that already. Okay. So I talked a little bit before about this failure is learning concept, right? This is the growth mindset. We're always learning. We're always growing. Neuroplasticity. I get so excited when something happens and it completely goes the way that I didn't expect. I'm like, woo, we learned, right? So I'm teaching them and I'm modeling them with them that failures happen. And we can adapt to them. We need to adapt to them, right? Just because this one strategy didn't work doesn't mean that we're doomed forever, right? We'll figure out another strategy. It's a bummer that that didn't happen, right? But we can kind of roll with it, right? Um, building resilience, so that idea of, you know, we're all going to hit these obstacles. And we can't prevent the kids from falling down, but we can show them how to get back up, right? How do we experience pain and then grow from it. Nobody's going to have a life without pain. We're all going to have pain, right? So pain is guaranteed. Suffering is optional, right? We don't need to suffer with our pain. So how can we teach the kids that pain is inevitable? It's not pleasant and we can learn from it, right? Um, avoiding fostering dependence, so letting the kids you make their own mistakes, right? Letting them kind of strategize about ways that they could approach things. Um, and then I have a big plug for DBT in schools. So true DBT in the outpatient model is a once a week individual DBT therapy, a once a week DBT skills group. So it's not like a processing group, chat group. Um, it's, it's a, there's a curriculum. We're teaching distress tolerance skills, emotion regulation skills, interpersonal effectiveness skills, dialectical skills, and mindfulness. At every single group, we're doing mindfulness. And so, and then, so those two things. Then there's a 24-hour phone coaching. So I am available to my clients, my DBT clients, 24-7. If they're in crisis, they reach out to me. I coach them through some of the skills to apply. It's not a therapy session over the phone, but it's coaching and then we're gonna dissect it when they come in for their next session. And then the last thing is that uh, the DBT therapist has to be on a consultation team with other DBT therapists, right? So there might be some people out there who, you, who say they do DBT in their sessions. Ask them if they do phone coaching and consultation team. If they're not doing that, they're not really DBT. They might be doing sprinkles and that's great, it's better than nothing, 
right? But there is a new curriculum, and I have a book here, about DBT in schools. So the curriculum of DBT has been adapted to be taught as like a health class, right? It's already been written to be applied to schools, to teach kids in the classrooms how to tune into their emotions, how to regulate, how to get through a crisis situation without making it worse, how to you know, do all the things that we're talking about, right? So I have a big, big, big push about getting DBT as a class in schools. There are a lot of schools in, like the D adolescent DBT people are primarily in New York, so they've got a lot of DBT in, in those schools and just the, the outcomes are phenomenal with kids being able to regulate their emotions in much more healthy ways. So, um, big push on that. Thank you. Yeah. What's your penetration on that? Like, are you actually trying to work with our school district to integrate that? And what's the outlook? Yeah, so there's, there are a couple schools that I am consulting with. Um, there's a lot of administrative school committee factors. A lot of the schools locally are, um, doing these these uh, specialized classes where say a kid's been out because of a hospitalization sometimes even a concussion a medical hospitalization and they need to have like a um, a validating and a dialectical place to be when they come back to school so sometimes this is called a start program a stars program uh, what do they call it in algonquin rise right. yep so and a lot of those programs have some sprinkles of dbt in there right so there it's kind of a, um, a targeted kind of a strategy. Um, one of the schools I'm consulting with, they're picking particular kids and they're running the group with those kids during the school day and they're having some great results. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm beating the drum as loudly as I can, right? Because my groups are full. My groups are so full. So if we could apply some of this universally to kids, maybe a lot of them wouldn't need to come to my groups, right? So they'd be able to get this stuff at school and um, follow up with it at home and, and really kind of, you know, be able to absorb some of that. Does that answer your question? More, yeah. more or less. Yeah, I mean, I'm specifically interested in, you know, our school district in our yeah. So are, yeah. you, are you doing that in Trottier? Is there some kind of program? Not at Trottier yet. I can reach out to them. I'm sure they'd be thrilled. Um, I know up at Algonquin, um, some of the some of the adjustment counselors have been DBT trained. Um, the training, though, is super intense, and you come out of it going, "What just happened?" Because the DBT is a very very in depth kind of treatment protocol. Um, but they are running some groups as well, I believe. I'm not sure how much it's taking taking flight, but um, it is there. Yeah, yeah, there are bits and pieces of it, Sarah. Yes, please. And I know both of these are trained. Yep. Nowhere near as extensively as Carrie, but we have offered some, um, you may have some stress management classes. Um, if we call them therapy groups or group yes. therapy, you know, that's stigmatizing. We won't get people that way, but that's what we're offering. Mm -hmm. um, and so if people are interested here in South Borough, um, can find us at the end. You know, this we're making our plans for next year, so if there's enough interest, there's a potential that we can drop it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As the skills group, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. DBT informed. DBT informed. Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's a good <laughs> distinction. If somebody's saying they're DBT informed, that you can trust that they're not advertising themselves as DBT. So, which is a whole different. Yeah. Okay, we talked about DBT as originally for borderline personality yep. disorder. Um, how do the things that you would use DBT for mm -hmm. differ from CBT? Excellent question. So what DBT is, it was based from CBT. So the person who created it was originally trained as a CBT therapist. And she actually is coming out with a memoir soon about her own lived experience being institutionalized, self-harming, suicidal herself as, as a younger adult. And then she knew that she was in the the significant pain, she did her work, she wanted to help others who'd been in pain. So she got trained as a CBT therapist, which at the time was the most effective kind of treatment protocol that there was out there. And she wanted to use it with folks who were really suffering emotionally, those high sensitivity, high reactivity, slow return to baseline, completely backfired. Because how they heard CBT, which is very much like, let's notice your thinking pattern. What's an ant, an automatic negative thought? 
right? How can you reframe this? What coping skill can you implement, right? Which is very logical, but those of us with high sensitivity and really painful emotions hear that as what I'm feeling is wrong and I should fix it. Right, so it completely backfired. So she realized that, you know, in her lived experience, she did a lot of work with validation and acceptance and mindfulness. And so she kind of shut that down and did a lot of that. And then the feedback she was getting with her clients was, you know, this is great, I'm feeling more connected with myself, I'm feeling validated, grounded, but nothing's changing. So she had this aha moment that she has to merge the two. And there's the dialectic. CBT is all about change, which is great, it's necessary, right, to grow. But if we do it without the validation first, those of us with a high sensitivity are gonna feel invalidated and dig in harder, right? So it's a lot of mindfulness, self-regulation, being able to tune into, you know, my experience is, you know, when my husband said to me that my emotions are, you know, ridiculous or whatever he said, I'm, be, I'm able to say to myself, this is how I feel and this is my truth. And he doesn't get it and that's okay, but this is true for me. And now what can I do with it, right? So that's the DBT mindset, right? So for instance, if like sometimes people use CBT for phobias. CBT for phobias, yep, very helpful. Could you use DBT for phobias if you didn't, put, like, is there yeah. like certain, you know, um, diagnostic? Yeah, like for yeah. impulsivity, would you yep. use DBT or? Depending, yeah. Is depending. it not, it's, it's usually like not a mood, mutually exclusive? Yeah, no, it's okay. usually like a mood dysregulation kind of a situation. Okay. Where, um, where DBT is really helpful, although we are implementing it with like anxiety and panic disorders, um, sometimes focus issues, depends on a lot of different factors, right? So not everything needs DBT. So, but although I kind of love it, so <laughs> works for, I'll, I do DBT and you know, all of my, th just smatterings of it. Sometimes I'm not doing the full protocol, but yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah. So um, you had mentioned quickly about the massacre generation yeah. and how they're getting kind of all these signals, you know, from kindergarten on. Yeah. So what would we do about that? I mean, do we just not talk about it at all so that we don't reinforce what they're getting? Yeah. So talking about it is always best because if we don't talk about it, we're sending them the message that they, this is too uncomfortable to discuss. Right? We always want to try to have a line of communication, especially when it's uncomfortable. So you could even go home to them, you know, tonight or tomorrow and say, you know what, I heard this thing and it really struck me. What do you think about it? And get some stuff from them, right? And it's really just kind of touching base and saying, you know, this is, this is a thing that kids these days are having to live with. It's a new reality. And I'm really curious how it impacts you. Right? And because every kid's going to hear it differently. For some kids, it's no big deal. For some kids, it's terrifying. Right, and every kid's different. So how does it impact that kid and then validate it? It makes sense that they're feeling the way they are, right? You may not feel the same way, but it's, it's okay that they feel their way, right? Does that make sense? Yeah? So always approach. Any other questions? Comments, concerns, bad jokes? Bad jokes? I thought it was pretty um, impactful on that same note about the massacre generation. Yeah. Is the part on the slide, you didn't even speak to it on the slide, said, um, you know, something about and the adults don't seem to be doing anything yeah. about it, which yeah. I think is really very impactful. Yeah, yeah. And there's something, you know, my kids are still kind of little, so I tread lightly. Um, but I, we, we have communication in our household that this is something that we're concerned about and we're doing what we can and we're working to keep them safe and you know what we can do in you know our, our little household about things like that um, but the, a lot of kids are feeling that way that you know the world is saying that it's not important for them so it's something to validate them for but yeah yeah any other questions yeah I just want to say we had a big things mm -hmm. I have a 17 year old yes really suffering mm -hmm. so I learned a lot tonight mm -hmm. um, taking more shirt out is, yes is huge yeah yeah so yeah. broke up with the bullet girlfriend broke up with him about seven or eight weeks ago Ouch, yeah and someone at school the adjustment counselor at school told today told him he should be over that yeah. Oh. <laughs> yep. So this is this is what we see. Like with the best of intentions, even people who are trained 
are still doing these invalidations. It's really hard to yeah. do it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I learned a lot about what I did wrong. <laughs> okay, so there's no wrong. There's no wrong. There's only opportunities to grow, right? So, so we're, we're learning what doesn't work, and then we're going to try what does work. Right? We're all doing the best we can, especially us as parents. Right? And so this is, you know, to learn more, I'm doing a parent weekend um, at the end of June. It'll be four hours on a Saturday, four hours on a Sunday um, to get way more in depth about this and some of the other DBT things that I talk about um, kind of as like a, a starting point. And then I do a 12-week parent seminar series. It's uh, Friday nights. I'll start the next one in September because it's Friday night. Some people aren't going to come in over the summer on Friday night. Um, but I call it date night. So you can come in on a Friday night, get some DBT, go out to dinner afterwards, right? And so we'll be going really in-depth about the DBT curriculum, not as in-depth as the kids get because they get a full year. But for parents, it's really helpful for us to regulate ourselves so we can model and coach the kids ways that they can use some of these strategies too. So priority goes to the kids already in our DBT program and their parents, but we usually have some openings here or there for additional parents. So if you want to sign up, let me know. So, yeah. School start times. Yes. That's not changing at, at least right away. Right? A lot of like issues. Stuff is what we've got. Yeah. But what, how do you feel about like teenagers taking like melatonin to try to get their system to go to sleep a little earlier? It's it's a stopgap, you know. Um, it's better than nothing, and it makes the brain rely on it, yeah. right? This external thing. So what I really encourage kids to do about sleep times is to have um, a sleep hygiene routine, right? So it kind of tells your body, your brain, okay, it's time to go to bed now. So maybe if, if the melatonin isn't fully kicking in yet, you know, there's that, okay, I'm gonna put my electronics aside at that's eight o'clock. I know they look at me like, yeah, right. But, you know, put my electronics aside at eight o'clock because of the screen times and kind of maybe watch an episode of something and then I'm gonna brush my teeth and then read for a little bit and, and that kind of gets them prepared to fall asleep better. So that that is my preference versus adding a melatonin and if they're not getting enough sleep, it's better than, better than the alternative. Just don't go high on the dose. Try to stay as low on the dose as possible, so. Yeah. Uh, so I know you mentioned about the phase of 20 to 30 minutes, mm -hmm. like emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What if that goes beyond and I know it's not happening? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what do you change your approach or are you still on the same tip? Then? Validation, 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 validation. So what is the normal time that, okay, after this I need to, <laughs> I need to do something. Right, besides, right. Right, right, right. So well, what is the normal time to have that emotion? Like, right. So, so what you may want to do prior to kind of waiting for the moment and see what happens, right, is to sit down with your kid and say, you know what, I kind of heard this stuff, how does this work for you? What's beneficial for you? What can I do as the parent when you're in this phase, right? Do you want me to leave you alone? Do you want me to come in and just sit with you? Do you want me to validate you? Do you want me to distract you? What do you want me to do as a parent? And then have that kind of planned out in advance so that when it does escalate, you're gonna have some strategies that you don't have to kind of like, you know, figure out as you go. You're gonna have some strategies to try and test out, right? Um, you know, it, it depends on the kid. You know, I would, I would have a conversation with them when they're in that wise mind place first to see. Um, you know, if something isn't working for a half hour, you know, take a step back and make sure that you're in a balanced place because they might be feeding, if we're having anxiety about situations lasting that long, they're gonna feel it, especially if they're high sensitivity. So try to get yourself in a place where you're being mindful, and then that might help de-escalate them too. Right, make sense? Yeah, there's no, there's no easy answer, right? To build on that, is validation yeah. still the technique when, when the situation is about I'm not doing the laundry, or you know, when it's about a disciplinary conversation, when they're, you know, they're sort right. of not well, It depends on the context. Weight. It depends on the context. Like if you're at, if you're having a like a big argument about it, probably not the time to kind of get into the particulars, right? You can and there's a way to validate and still set a limit, right? So validating isn't agreeing. Validating, saying I can see that you're really frustrated about this. I'm really frustrated about it too. We've had this conversation a lot. Let's kind of go to our separate corners and kind of come back to this when 
we're both kind of able to talk about this in a reasonable kind of a way, right? And then holding them accountable, right? And it doesn't, you know, you can set up a plan kind of like the same idea. You know, if you're not going to do your laundry, then here's what the, con we talked about here's what the consequences are going to be. And I know it sucks, and I know it's not fair, right? So you're validating and holding, it's a dialectic, right? You're validating and holding the limit, right? Or, and you can also do that whole um, failure is learning and let them go to school thinking. Natural consequences, they're a marvelous thing in high school, right? They'll figure it out. It's their choice, right? You know what I mean? Give them the power to kind of make the decisions for themselves. Yeah. So, and again, not every situation is identical. So, but there was a hand up over here. Okay. All right. Any other comments, questions? Yeah? Just to that point, you know, is the difference between not doing their laundry and doing something risky or totally. dangerous yes. or whatever? Like yes, yes, yes. Would you handle that differently than just saying, well, if you're going to do that, these are the consequences? Right, right, right. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I would definitely, you know, have parameters and limits. And again, for every kid, it's different. Um, and just, you know, this behavior is not allowed. And here's the limit. And you can hate me. And that's okay. Because my job as your parent is to keep you safe. And you don't have to like it. But this is what I'm going to do, right? So, um, so if you make that decision, you know right now this is the consequence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can outline that. Sometimes, um, especially as kids are getting older and the rules that they're testing are new, right? The, the, the rules that they had when they're 12 are not the rules that they have when they're 17. So the more proactive conversation you can have with them, the better. So they know what's coming, you right? You wouldn't do that during that 30-minute you know, hot spot. Yeah, I wouldn't do it during that. Yeah. Right. So if they're escalated, if they broke a rule, a really significant one, and they're, they're at a place where they're okay, and they're, you know, that, well, they're physically safe, but it's not the time to have that discussion, you can still wait to, for things to de-escalate and then say, this is unacceptable behavior. And we talked about that. And these are going to be the consequences. And you can validate. And, you know, I know your friends were peer pressuring you into it, and it's a really tricky situation. A lot of kids are going through this and it's still not acceptable in our house, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And in, in the DBT book, there's actually a page of what's typical for adolescents, increased moodiness, not cleaning up after yourself, like to, to some degree. And then where is it where things really need to kind of get escalated in terms of parental or therapeutic response, right? So, so there's, there's pages about that, okay. Well, thanks, everyone. If you have any questions, see me afterwards. I have um, handouts about the different things that we're offering. Thank you. Oh, why does the seagull fly over the sea? Because if he flew over the bay, he'd be a bagel.